Coming up on DTNS, Google open sources differential privacy, and we'll tell you why you might care. Facebook launches its dating service in the United States and products to light your way, play your sweet music, and let you be Star-Lord from IFA in Berlin. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 5th, 2019. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From the shores of Lake Merritt, I'm Justin Robert Young. I'm... And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about reviews and, and the perils and, and portents of, of dealing with review units and how people review technology on Good Day Internet. If you want that and the other wider conversation, which also involved ice cream trucks, you can get Good Day Internet by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Sources tell Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and Debbie Wu that Apple is working on an in-display fingerprint reader similar to ones already used in Android phones from Samsung, OnePlus, and Huawei to launch an iPhone's possibly as early as 2020. Although analyst Ming-Chi Kuo reported his sources said that Apple's work on an in-display touch ID is targeted for release in 2021. Bloomberg also reported that Apple will bring out an affordable iPhone in the $400 range in the first half of 2020. TechCrunch's Zach Whitaker reports that security researcher Sanyam Jain at the GDI Foundation discovered an unprotected server with several databases containing more than 419 million records of people's phone numbers and Facebook IDs, along with some other information. It appears the data was scraped from Facebook back before Facebook restricted access to users' phone numbers. They put that restriction in place in April 2018. It's unknown who owned the server with these databases on it. But after TechCrunch contacted the web host of the server, the databases were removed. It's not known if anyone else besides the security researcher or the server's owner ever accessed the information, but at least it's not out in the public anymore. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what Facebook's doing in the dating world, Justin. Mm-hmm, Tom. <laughs> Facebook expanded its dating service to the U.S. Thursday and added the ability to integrate Instagram images into a dating profile through your, though not, your Instagram handle. The U.S. is the 20th market to get Facebook dating. As a refresher, here's how Facebook dating works by default. Facebook dating does not include your friends, and you can choose to exclude friends of friends. You can also block any profile from ever seeing your dating profile come up. However, if you'd like to connect with a friend over Facebook dating, you can list them as one of your nine secret crushes. If they also like you as a secret crush, you'll both be notified. If you choose, you can enable the ability to be connected with prospective dates who are attending the same events as you, uh, as you join the same groups uh, as you as well. Facebook will recommend prospective dates based on factors like, quote, your preferences, interests, prospective dates based on other factors or sorry, and other things you do on Facebook. Chats are limited to text and gifts. Facebook dating is expected to launch in Europe 2020. Coming to you, France. Oh, Facebook dating. Now, I know it's been around for a while, but now that it's officially available in the U.S., and I love to talk about a new app and how it differs from the U.S., this is kind of, it's almost backwards land because Facebook is all about messaging necessarily. You still can't have a thousand. Oh, man, you're, you're, you're breaking up on us because Facebook doesn't oh, want to no. hear you criticize Facebook dating. Okay, try again. What about now? Go for it. Okay. Keep going. So Facebook is all about having a bunch of friends, right? So the idea that, okay, well, your Facebook friends, you probably don't want service on your dating profile. Most dating profiles just see your friends are a metric in that sense. Just, <laughs> what? What are you laughing at? No, no yeah. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're definitely breaking up a, a, oh, okay. a little Re bit. Recon I'll reconnect. Yeah. Reconnect and, uh, and, and, and tell us why Facebook dating will not work. Uh, because I, I honestly, I, and I, I got to save some of this for when she can hear me, but I honestly think this is a smart thing for Facebook to do. It's a good way for Facebook to do it. It has a little bit of the Facebook and Libra association problem where everybody is going to criticize it because Facebook's doing it, not because of how they're doing it. But, but Sarah, try, try again. Tell me, tell me what you think of Facebook dating. 
All right, are you guys ready to hear yes, my opinion right. now? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to summarize what I said before. So Facebook is like the opposite of how a dating app works, the way that they're going about this, right? Because they're like, you probably don't want to date your friends or we'd already know about that. However, maybe up to nine of them, you secretly do want to date. So we're going to do a really juvenile, like MySpacey type thing where you can like have nine secret crushes like do you do you have nine people on facebook that you secretly would maybe want to date that just seems like a really high number to me but okay fine maybe you're single you're you know want to increase the pool well, you don't have cool. to use all nine it's so that you don't run out it's, 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 it's just a funny like up to nine like that's actually no, a feature no, that no, no, stop, in. stop it no it is to nine because otherwise you'd be infinite like, well, like, no, like, there, no, there's a limit. There are not nine people that I'm friends with on Facebook that I want. But there, to there would be there, people there, who would abuse it if, if it weren't a limit. Uh, okay, no, you're right. You're fine, right. You're right. Fine. Look, if there are nine people that you secretly want to have a relationship with, you, you're you're a contestant on The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Like this is, uh, I I agree with Sarah, but I also agree with Tom. This is a good idea. In fact, I think that if they would have done stuff like this earlier on, then maybe. Uh, uh, we would have a, a fonder idea of Facebook because this is leveraging the idea of their social graph so you can uh, find people that you'd like to date. And even though I, I, I agree that the idea of a secret crush, and by the way, that data leak is going to be amazing, mm -hmm. uh, is, is a little juvenile. It's fine. It's fun. It's, it's, they want to do a fun thing. It's the name that's juvenile. What I think Facebook is doing on the back end is super smart, which is saying, look, you already know your friends. If you're going to date, your friends or your friends of friends, they can introduce you in person. We're only going to get into this when it's somebody you wouldn't meet otherwise. So we're going to block off your friends. We're going to let you block off friends of friends if you want. But if you're like, you know what, though, I do really like this person and I want to maybe meet them through Facebook. That's what the secret crush thing is. They want it to be sure. enough that you'll use it. That's why it's nine. And if but they, they don't, don't want it to be so back, much better then... to be abused by people harassing other people. So they put a limit on it. I, I okay it's so your name though it's a well, juvenile name you're right also and this is nitpicky i know but it's not so much that i'm like ooh, data breach this is gonna get ugly although it would but it's more of how many times does someone i kind of casually met once invite me to like a page all the time right yeah. and sometimes i'm trying to be polite and like that data going into who i might get matched up with that isn't a friend of a friend type thing that makes me be like oh gosh i'd have to really curate my likes and groups and events a little bit more carefully because right now i don't take that stuff seriously on facebook i usually but, ignore but it, it but it's only, it would only suggest a person you could be like oh yeah no right it's it's only going to suggest them it's not going to let them, <laughs> i don't have don't to say, go on a date with somebody who joins a group yeah if you I'm don't say yes then they will never know they were matched with sure, but i understand but, that but, but from other... the billions of people that i might you know have something in common with that data on facebook is like the least interesting part about me is my point. Absolutely. And it's a lot easier to hone exactly what you want out of a dating app if you don't have to do stuff like that. On other dating apps, it's just like, okay, I want these certain things in a person that and that are like non-negotiable. The secret sauce theoretically for this is that it has this other data, so you'd have to actually take it seriously for it to work. And there has big advantages in that Facebook does already know a lot about you, so you don't have to give it extra information for it to make a good match. And it already makes its money off you. So they don't have a vested interest in keeping you dating. Uh, the, if you have a successful relationship, unlike Tinder or Match.com, they don't lose. In fact, if you have a successful relationship, they still win because then you start putting photos of your lovely relationship on Facebook and using Facebook even more. So there, there are some benefits to Facebook doing this, and I think this might be incredibly successful. Of course. <sighs> yeah, it's all, all right. personal data, and they, and they get even more of it. As you fall in love, yeah, that's one word for it. Okay. <laughs> Moving on, Sam, they announced the one. Galaxy Fold will launch in Korea September 6th and follow with a launch in France, Germany, and Singapore on September 18th, with other markets following after that. Samsung also announced that the Galaxy Fold premier service that gives you access to free technology support will happen at any time. Tom Warren over at The Verge reports what's changed in the fixed version to the fold. First, the protective film now extends under the bezels so it won't tempt you to peel it off. The hinge gaps 
are smaller. There are also added layers of metal underneath the display. People report it starting to feel sturdier now. Good changes. The display also has a small plastic protection caps at the top and bottom to help keep debris out. Obviously very important for our foldable phone, foldable device at all. And the only software change that Warren notes is the ability to align the Android nav bar on the left or the center. Yes, they didn't do anything with the software, which is a, a little weird, but I guess they were just so focused on hardware they didn't want to spend any time on that. But yeah, we can now get back to deciding if we need a foldable tablet rather than deciding whether the Galaxy Fold is a horrible piece of equipment. Mm, I don't know. I'm not betting on it yet. <laughs> I feel like uh, I, I'm just going to take the value play it over, no matter what, any, any fold news. I, I, I fold. <laughs> uh, Google released an open source version of its differential privacy library. Differential privacy uh, is a system that mixes user data with noise so that the results of data analysis can't be used to identify a person or source in the underlying data set. Uh, this famously happened with some AOL data. It happened with some Netflix data where the data was anonymized, but you could take other data outside of the data set and figure out whose Netflix profile it was. And differential privacy promises to make that harder or, or hopefully impossible. Uh, you may have heard Apple you talk about it. Apple uses differential privacy to draw insights from iPhone users while protecting anonymity. Google uses its own differential privacy tool in Chrome. And differential privacy from Google available on GitHub will let organizations conduct more data analysis cheaply without risking user privacy as well as open up their model to eyes that can look for vulnerabilities and improve it and make it work better. Because there are a lot of people who criticize differential privacy as not achieving the goal as well as its proponents would like. All right, let's, let's break this down. Tom, which leaks would have not happened had they been using this Google open source differential privacy library? <laughs> None. It doesn't stop breaches. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a firewall. Worthless. Uh, Worthless. Yeah. Tom. All this does is say, I want to put out an analysis of Facebook dating data. <laughs> but everybody's like, well, wait a minute. Even if you anonymize it, you're going to be able to go through there. You're going to be able to take my public posts and figure out who I am. And so differential privacy says, no, we'll put in noise. For, for example, they can put in uh, a, a statistically predictable amount of false data. So let's say you are a male in the data set, they'll change you to female. Uh, they won't That's change, the every, noise. They won't change everyone to female. They'll change just enough that it's statistically inert and doesn't affect the overall conclusions, right? But it makes it impossible or more difficult to dig into that data and go, okay, based on what we know about this person and this IMDB data I got and this Netflix data I got, I bet that's Tom Merritt in there. So, okay, so we, we spoke recently about the idea of folks who are concerned about smart speakers listening in, right? That data is somewhat anonymized, but there are situations where if a human might hear it on the other side, somebody might say their own name, or there might be a way to be able to identify folks. And one of, one of the ideas that came up was, yeah, obfuscate the person's actual voice, um, make it gender neutral, so you really don't know if it's a man or a woman. Would that fall under differential privacy? Say that again. <laughs> uh, so, so if when, you're taking data from people's voices that a smart speaker might be collecting, it might be collected in a cloud somewhere. And right. you did something like change the pitch of someone's voice so that you wouldn't be able to say, oh, that's Sarah. I know what she sounds like. I don't what, think that's differential privacy hmm. because it's voice data. Differential privacy seems to apply mostly to data points, not voice. I think when you get into voice recording, you're talking about something totally different. We're Got talking it. about information about a person, a recording, I, I think, and again, I'm not an expert in the in data analysis and data science. So any data scientists who want to clarify this, please feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. But I think that would be a separate thing. Got it. Uh, but yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fix the Siri stuff, but it, it would. Again, Netflix put out a library that said, hey, we don't have any identifiable information in here, but people were able to go, well, yeah, but that profile with the anonymized ID matches all of the things that this person over at IMDb said. So it must, must be that person. Differential privacy would obfuscate that. So it'd be hard, really hard to do. Facebook has asked its AI researchers to produce fake videos featuring actors doing and saying routine things. 
the uh, dates containing the clip will be released at an AI conference at the end of the year to help test and benchmark deep fake detect, uh, de detection tools. Facebook will dedicate 100, sorry, 10 million to fund detection technology through grants and prizes. It is partnering with Microsoft a partnership on AI, MIT, UC Berkeley, and Oxford to launch a deep fake challenge to reward the best detection methods. Uh, you know what? This is great. Uh, you, you want all of those folks partnering up on figuring out how to detect a fake before fakes have gotten uh, up to be a problem, right? right. This, this yeah. is a good example of the industry trying to get ahead of something before it is an issue. I totally agree. And it's been an element of, of as friends of mine even have uh, sounded the alarm about the incoming death of truth that we are going to have as we will be able to believe nothing in a world of deep fakes and uh, audio manipulation that how is this functionally different than how somebody who first saw Photoshop would have thought that that we are going to have an incoming death of truth because now we won't be able to believe anything we see in a still picture. What really happened was Photoshop pictures have certain tells. You are able to figure out whether or not something has been Photoshop or at least people who use that program a lot do. And now you can do that uh, 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 programmatically. So I'm excited to see this because hopefully they succeed because otherwise the world is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think you're right. Even if, even without this, we would eventually all start to figure it out the way we now look at even HD video now and go like, Oh yeah, that's early HD. You know, like we even, but when it was first HD first came out, we're like, it's like looking through a window, right? We get used <laughs> to it. And, and I think deep fakes would be the same way, but Hey, if we can get there faster because of this, I'm all for it. Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, time for a roundup of products from IFA in Berlin. Let's start with HMD, the folks that make the Nokia brand of phones now for Nokia. Uh, Nokia 6.2 and 7.2 mid-range phones announced, which are, are important in the industry and, and, and they have nice cameras. But if you like the resurrected brands like the 3310 and the 8110, you may also like the resurrected Nokia 2720 flip phone. It has a larger 2.8 inch display than the original, runs KaiOS, gives you some apps like Google Maps, YouTube, WhatsApp. Also has Google Assistant. So if you don't remember how to do text entry with T9 anymore, you can just talk to the new <laughs> 2720. Uh, it's dual SIM, supports LTE. Can you be used to tether for data? Has 27 days of standby time coming in September for 89 euros. Also the Nokia 800, which is a rugged phone, IP68 for dust and waterproofing, mill standard 810G for things like humidity, direct sunlight, noise, low pressure, temperature, can survive a two meter fall to concrete, has a carabiner bean loop and 43 hours of standby time. That one's coming in October for 109 euros. And if all you have is 18 euros, you can get the Nokia 110, which can side load music on an SD card. That's coming in September. Where are we at on the retro tech idea? The, I mean, because the, the flip phone obviously was like iconic to so many that are listening now. It, it's great for dramatic breakups. If, oh, amazing. That's, uh, I mean, it, it, nothing's better. You know, it was the golden I, age of cinema, quite honestly. I but. also like, I like this move and this is going to be really awesome for audio listeners. Uh, uh, since this episode's already had such rich audio bouquet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when you just took it and kind of like flipped it under your chin, so it's just like a one-handed close instead of using your fingers. That was a good move. Oh yeah, that's mm -hmm. that is uh, that's high-level stuff. <laughs> I mean, the the forty-three hours of stand, but you know, you see something like that, you're like, whoa, awesome. I I don't really know about the retro stuff, Justin. I I there were things I liked about a flip phone. I'm now used to a different form factor altogether. We're kind of talking about a flip-ish. A hybrid phone coming back into the scene from a variety of manufacturers, foldables, you know, it's, that's all part of the same deal. So I'm interested to see the form factor come back, but I don't know how many folks besides the novelty of it are really looking for this. Well, no, what well, they are looking if, for is it low people price. Are, people are willing to pay $350 for the light phone too, because it, it'll not distract them. They'll pay oh. 89 euros for a 2720. That's basically the same thing. That's much cheaper. Yeah, but I think that there you're, it's two different things. You, you would buy a phone to save money. You would pay a lot of money for a phone to restrict your activity the way you might pay a personal trainer. But the 2720 trainer. is going to do the same thing. 
it's going to restrict your activity because it it does it's not a full operating system. Sure. So at that point, you have to you know you have to be on board with the the feature set. I suppose Google Assistant's great. Google Assistant is, I mean, it's the best assistant that I use on a regular basis. So, you know, having that rather than, yes, uh, remembering the old way of doing text entry, which I absolutely don't remember, although I'm sure it would come back. It's probably like riding a bike. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to, there's a lot of good that comes out of a phone that's a little bit simpler and the price and excellent battery life is just two extras. Listen, folks, that's just the Nokia stuff. We got a ton more from Aoife to tell you about. <laughs> Sonos Move, Bluetooth speaker, 10 inches tall, weighs six pounds, Wi-Fi and AirPlay 2, 10-hour battery life. It's actually a bigger speaker than some other Sonos speakers, but it's meant to be portable, at least in your home. IP56 dust and water resistance rating charges on an included base, or you can charge it directly by USB-C. Has Amazon or Google Voice support, just like all the Sonos speakers. Pre-order for $399, shipping September 24th. There's also the Sonos Port, which is the successor to the Sonos Connect, that's the one that connects to your existing powered stereo or receiver. So it's got RCA in and out, digital audio out, two Ethernet cables, a 12 volt trigger so it can turn on your stereo or receiver. Pre order that one for $399 as well, shipping September 12th. And Sonos One SL, the successor to the Sonos Play One. Uh, the big advantage here is no built in mic. If you're like, no, I don't want this thing listening to me, but I do want a Sonos speaker, pre order this one for $179, shipping September 12th. Yeah. So the Sonos One. SL <laughs> could be for Sarah Lane, but I don't think that, that is. <laughs> it, it's the Sonos oh. One without assistant. I have two Sonos Ones. The 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 audio quality is great. Yes, I talk to them, but if I didn't, this is a great option for someone who's like, well, I, you know, I, I I'd like to sort of expand my Sonos experience for a lot less money. And yeah, the assistant part I don't need or I don't want. I'll tell you this: that move is a chungus. That is a massive speaker for Six that. Six pounds of... to take it to the beach? Well, that's it. No, I think you're, not taking, you're just taking that out to the patio. That's not going to the patio. Yeah. yeah. No, that is. Uh, it's uh, water resistant. It's a for your sprinklers. <laughs> it's for your yacht. Or your pool. It's actually probably a pool site. Yeah, that's probably. But true. what about your yacht that has a pool? Right. Or that's that. where you really need it. Uh, that's what yeah. it's meant for. People with yachts that have pools on them. Or just, you know, you're going camping. You're going to be away for more than a night on or two. On your yacht with the pool. Yeah. yeah. True story. <laughs> I camped once and I, I got yelled at by the park ranger for playing my music too loud. Yeah. Was it loud? Uh, no. In fact, I was watching Emily. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Not shook a lot. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's talk about Sony. Uh, Sony announced uh, the, their big announcement that everybody's talking about is the WF H800 here wireless earbuds coming in red, green, blue, black, or coral. 16 hours of battery life. That's eight from playback, eight from the case. Uh, and better fit. Contact with the ear in three spots so they shouldn't fall out. Coming to Australia in January, 350 bucks and other places after that. They also had a bunch of Walkmen. A uh, high-res audio Walkman running Android coming to November of 320 pounds. A throwback Walkman that is designed to pay homage to the original TPS L2. That one's 400 pounds coming in November 2019. And the Xperia 5 phone that works with a PlayStation controller for wireless gaming. 6.1-inch uh, display, 21-9 aspect ratio. They show it that it can, you can use it for Fortnite. You can get that one in black, white, blue, or magenta. That's coming to Europe in October for 699 pounds. Well, as a as a newly converted wireless earbud person for life, uh, I I love the idea of the WFH uh, eight thousand or eight hundred rather wireless earbuds. The colors a little perplexing to me. I know for some people they're like, you know, I want you know make a statement. I don't want colors in my ears. It'd be like wearing red earrings every day. It would never match anything. It's just kind of strange. But I think sure for a variety that's great. What's interesting about these earbuds is what we don't know about them because the M3 noise canceling wireless earbuds that Sony recently announced got a lot of good attention, good reviews, but they have this very strange uh, omission and that is being able to adjust volume on the set itself. Whatever it's tethered to, you have to do it that way, which I'm like, that's insane. So you, we don't know if these headphones have the same issue or not. I, I I have similar reservations. <laughs> I, I I think that there is a. They're also a, really expensive. Yeah, that that we 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 are in a great world for wireless uh, earbuds, but I I don't know. I, I would not jump at these immediately. 
Uh, we also got a bunch of Philips Hue announcements. Uh, Edison lights, Philips Hue Edison lights. That means no color adjustment because they always need to have that warm yellow glow. But they, when they're on, they look like Edison lights. Uh, the A19 fa form factor for 25 bucks. The ST19 tubes for 28 bucks. The G25 globes for 33 bucks coming to the U.S. in October. Uh, first Philips Hue smart plug. A little expensive at 40 bucks, but if you're like, oh, everything must be Philips Hue for me to use it, man, yeah, there you go. Uh, Hue smart button. You can put this on your fridge or on a bedside table. Uh, you, you can click it to turn something off, or you can press and hold it to dim a light, for instance. That's 20 bucks. The Hue Go portable lamp has now been updated, so it stands up while charging. Uh, remember, this is a lamp that isn't plugged in all the time, so you can have more versatility of where you put it. Uh, longer battery life, too. Uh, three hours on full, bright, 18 hours on candle mode, November for $80. And if you must know, all but the smart button include Bluetooth, and the button uses Zigbee, so you don't need a hub for any of these. Uh, I'm certainly a big fan of the Hue bulbs. We have them all over our house. Uh, I think that the only thing that I immediately am going to have to get is the smart button. The idea that you can dim it is really the big feature here. And for 20 bucks, that's an auto get if you have more than a couple. Yeah, I mean, well, you can dim via your voice if it's connected to a voice assistant, but you have to do it like once, twice, three yeah. times, four times, you know, which I do every single night when I'm on the couch and I'm like, too bright in here. But yeah, I, I agree. The smart button is great. Smart plug, sure, that would come in handy. Um, I like the idea of a dimmable Edison bulb. Got a couple Edison bulbs in this house, which are sitting in a drawer right now because they're just too bright and the lamp itself does not have a dimmer built in. So this would be an easy switch. Yeah. Uh, Signify, the, the, the company that makes all these, uh, I, I think doing a good job in, in creating a, a, a full smart home set here. So I don't know that I would buy. I have a string of Edison lights in the backyard. I'm not going to pay 25 bucks a pop to replace those. But yeah, maybe here and there is accents. It might be cool. Uh, Lenovo announced the Smart Display 7, so it fits right in between its two previous sizes, a 7-inch screen. Uh, the speaker is now below the display, unlike the others where it has it on the side. It's more compact, and it's $130 bucks come in October. Lenovo also announced two tablets with a new Google Assistant mode called Ambient Mode that allows you to do some of the features of a smart speaker while it's in, while it's in a tablet. Uh, so, so that's a new mode from Google that's being featured in these two new tablets, the Lenovo yoga smart tab, which has a 1920 by 1200 display and a kickstand. So you can kind of set it up on its kickstand, like it, like it's a, a display $250 coming this month. And the smart tab M eight, that's a 1280 by 800 display has far field mics built into it, by the way. Uh, but you have to put this one in a dock to have it go into ambient mode. That's $120 coming in October. Lenovo also announced a second game for its Mirage augmented reality headset. So now in addition to Star Wars Jedi challenges, you can also play Marvel Avengers Dimension of Heroes and become Star-Lord or Thor or Doctor Strange. Along with the new game are a pair of universe controllers that have a semi-circular handle with control sticks on top. Uh, the new augmented reality with the new controllers is $240, the Mirage. Or if you already have a Mirage and we're playing Star Wars Jedi Challenges, you can now buy the new controllers, although they haven't got a price for those. They, they said it'll be less than $100. Uh, I, I, he's good stuff, man. <laughs> he's good stuff. <laughs> I know. We're like, we're, we've been inundated by IFA. It's yeah. like, hmm, wow, there's a lot of it mostly sounds good. Not gonna buy all of it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the idea of, of, of an ambient mode for Google Assistant is is uh, a, an interesting factor of like we, we know that we like smart speakers, we know that we like assistants. Where can we put them? There's this is yet another strand of spaghetti hitting the wall, and we'll see if it sticks. Mm -hmm. And real quickly, TCL showed off a mid-range phone called the Plex for 329 euros. Uh, more significantly than than that phone, TCL was talking about its plans to have more TCL branded phones in 2020, including 5G phones. Uh, TCL already makes phones under the BlackBerry and Alcatel brands, um, but it looks like they want to try to get their own name on a bunch of phones. So be looking for that in 2020. As all these products start rolling out, you see some interesting stories. Might want to submit them to our subreddit. You can submit stories. You can also vote on other stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. 
got some feedback about our conversation yesterday about Facebook saying, hey, federal agents doing secret stuff. You need to tell us your real name. John wrote it and said, I was thinking about your speculation on why Facebook doesn't want feds to have fake accounts to research visa applications and why the feds want a fake one instead of using their real names. John says, think of all the stuff an investigator would need to click on reviewing an account. And then imagine all the crazy ads they'd start seeing in their feed and how they might be personally profiled to advertisers or data providers. They might start to look like bad guys just for doing their jobs. Yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, Mike and Dusty Riyadh also said uh, the vast majority of visas are issued by the State Department, not DHS. DHS's role is adjudicating petitions for immigrant and working visas. So to prevent fraud, they might look at social media to look for things like fake marriages, criminal or terrorist affiliation, or out and out identity theft. And if they revoke the petition, DHS could be sued and might have to provide screen caps or evidence from their own social media accounts to justify the revocation. And that could open an officer up to harassment and threats, as well as expose their friends and family to the attention of unsavory characters who DHS is trying to keep out. Having a professional versus a personal account is common, and I consider a best practice. And why Facebook would want to expose DHS officers and their families to bad guys refused visas is beyond me. It will likely lead DHS employees to limit the use of Facebook and other social media to mitigate that exact problem. Anyhow, just a little background on how and why immigration officers might use social media and want separate accounts. Uh, great information, Mike. And thank you to both Mike and John uh, for the for the ideas there. Those are, those are both worth considering. Uh, certainly, there should be a solution, though, where a, an account can have a real name, but not be the personal account of that officer and and hope and somehow protect their identity. Yeah, thanks to everybody who writes in with feedback. Love your feedback. Keep it coming. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being our host today. Justin, tell folks where they can keep up with your work. Well, you can go ahead and get my free political newsletter at freepoliticalnewsletter.com. Five days a week, five stories a day, mostly gifts, sometimes hot takes. Uh, it has uh, been awesome. And, and thank you to all the, the DTNS listeners that have uh, supported it. And also a big shout out to all the DTNS folks that came out to the show in Austin where Tom Merritt uh, joined Night Attack at the Out of Bounds Comedy Festival. Thank you guys so much for supporting that. Yeah, we had DTNS hat right there in the audience. Mm -hmm. like repping, had, a, had a couple like swoop in at the very last minute. It drove all the way just to see us. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, also, we are thinking of changing our Patreon rewards. So we came up with a proposal. And if you haven't already, we need you to look it over. Let us know if there's anything in there you just can't live with. You can find the proposed Patreon reward changes at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. We love feedback. Have I mentioned we love feedback? Here's an email address, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also love it when you can join us live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Allison Sheridan and Len Peralta illustrating. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Simon Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>